Hey, welcome back to our second lecture on uh, BC 308, Revelation and Daniel. We are journeying through Daniel chapter 11. So just to quickly recap, um, Daniel 11 is um, where the angel Gabriel is giving a quick history in advance to Daniel starting from the Medo-Persians, that's verses 1, 2, and 3, and then verse 3, 4, about the Greek Empire. And then he says what will happen after the Greek Empire. There's going to be a period of time, uh, approximately 200 years, when there's going to be two other dynasties, one from the south, Egypt, one from the north, Syria, and they're going to be fighting each other. And of course, Israel is in the middle. Um, they've been overpowered. And they're, they're fighting with each north and the south are fighting with each other. So that's taking us through from um, verse 5, takes us through all the way to end of verse 35 of Daniel 11, these different kings and rulers who will be fighting each other. And historically, I've just listed out you know, the names. now. If you're interested in reading about these kings and what they did, you know, I'll just refer you back to that PDF we shared on the book of Daniel by John F. Woolward. Uh, where, you know, you'll read about the history of all of these people, these kings and who were fighting each other. But that's all a fulfillment of what Gabriel had mentioned from verse 5 to 35, which we refer to as the short term or the near term history. Right. So that means these things are going to happen right after the Medes, Persians, Greeks, and then all these these two dynasties will be fighting each other. And then if we come to the end of 35, verse 35, and then the end of verse 35 ends like this. He says, you know, um, and some of those of understanding shall fall, to refine them, purify them, make them white until the time of the end, because it is still for the appointed time. So all this will go on, then suddenly there's a shift to the time of the end. There is still for the appointed time. So he's saying, okay, all these things are going to happen, then there is the time. I'm, I'm moving now to the time of the end. I'm moving now to the appointed time. Then he says, verse 36, then. When? The time of the end, the appointed time. That means there's this final seven years, this final week, that something else is going to happen. Verse 36. Okay. Now, verse 36 on, we're talking about the time of the end, the appointed times. And it's really speaking to us specifically about the Antichrist, as I said just before we closed off the previous hour. So I want us to read verse 36 to. 45 and then just look at you know what 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 Gabriel said this man this antichrist will do right and uh, there's some interesting uh, uh, details given to us in addition to all that we've already seen in chapter 7 8 9 here's some additional details about this king who comes at the time of the end at the appointed time okay so verses 1 to 35 is the near term, the short term. That's all that's going to happen, which historically has happened. Verse 36, it's the time of the end. That's where something that we are looking forward to. That means it's still ahead of us. It's coming before us. Okay, so let's take uh, three verses each. Quickly read through that, please. 36 to 45 of Daniel 11. Sir, shall I read? Sure, sure. Three verses each, anyone. Um, Rupa, you can start, then Sri Kumar can continue. Okay, sir, thank you. And the king shall do as he wills. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak astonishing things against the god of gods. He shall prosper till the indignation is accomplished, for what is decreed shall be done. 
he shall pay no attention to the gods of his fathers or to the one beloved by women. He shall not pay attention to any other god, for he shall magnify himself above all. He shall honor the god of fortresses instead of these, a god whom his fathers did not know. He shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Shukumar? Yeah. At that time of the end of the king of south will engage him, engage him in battle, and the king of the north will storm out against him with chariots and cavalry. Oh, oh. Okay. Can you read verse 39, please? And continue from 39. Oh, sure, sure. Sorry. He will attack the mightiest fortress with the help of a foreign god and will greatly honor those who acknowledge him. He will make them rulers over many people and will distribute the land at a price. At the time of the end of the king of south will engage him in battle and the king of the north will storm out against him with chariots and cavalry and a great faith, great fleet of ships. He will invade many countries and sweep through them like a flood. He will also invade the beautiful land. Many countries will fall, but Edom, Moab, and the leaders of Ammon will be delivered from his hand. He will extend his power over many countries. Egypt will not escape. He will gain control of the treasure of gold and silver and all the riches of Egypt with the Libyans and Kushites and uh, in submission. But the reports, but the but the reports from the east and the north will alarm him, and he will set out in a great rage to destroy and annihilate many. He will pitch his royal tents between the seas at the uh, seas at the beautiful holy mountain. Yet he will come to his end, and no one will help him. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right, very interesting details. Now. How do we know that this passage, verses 36 on, is talking about something in the future? Again, I refer us back to, you know, what we saw from chapter 2 onwards. That chapter 2 onwards, from the very outline that was given for the book of Daniel, there are series of events that are short-term or near-term kingdoms that would happen. And then there is a kingdom that would come at the very end, something that happened at the very end, where during which time God will set up his kingdom. That that is the outline given in chapter two, which is repeated. Chapter seven, chapter eight, chapter nine. There is things that happen in the near term, short term, then there is something that's going to happen in the end. And what has been highlighted to us in chapter seven, eight, and nine is that this little horn that comes and overpowers 10 other horns, um, three of the 10 other horns, and begins to speak pompous things, that's the thing that's going to happen towards the end of time. And that becomes even more explicit in chapter 9 when we see how, you know, the, 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 the angel Gabriel broke this whole thing into two parts, the first 69 weeks and then the 70th week, the last week, clearly broke. And he positions this abomination of desolation in the last week, seven years. And then in chapter 11, once again, we see that kind of a breakup of time. Like we said, till 35, verse 35, it's all you know, near-term, short-term things are going to happen. End of verse 35, he suddenly shifts and says, look, until the time of the end. That means now I'm jumping over time. I'm going to the end of time. I'm going to the appointed time. That is the seventh, seventieth week. That's the appointed time. And it says then this king will come. The other thing we point out pointed out is that very characteristic of this particular king is he is not afraid to exalt himself above everyone, everything, and even God which other kings don't do. You know, other rulers come and go. But not they don't do this. This particular king, 
who comes in the appointed time, he, verse 36, he speaks blasphemies against the God of gods. And he's prospering because God has allowed that to happen until the determined time. God's okay. That seven year period is given. It's like that, okay, this time you do what you want, you know, but the end is there. God's coming to wrap it up. So verse 37, he has no regard for you know the God whom the fathers worshipped or women worship. He's going to exalt them all against all. And he's going to honor verse 38 and 39. He's going to honor a very strange God, an unknown God. He will honor with gold and silver, with, with precious stones. I mean, he's going to lavish so much on this unknown God. Now, when we come into the book of Revelation, we can see very clearly, Revelation 13, that this, the beast, he sets up this image. Now, he's supported by the dragon, so that the unknown God is the dragon, it's Satan backing up the Antichrist. And he sets up this image to be worshipped. Right? And uh, verse 39, you know, he will act against anything, everything, the strongest powers, with the help of this foreign God, unknown God. But that's Satan backing him up. Right? And uh, he's going to advance the glory of this unknown God. And he's going to have rule over many. So he's going to be very influential, a world leader. Verse 39. He's going to divide the land. He's going to divide the land. The, the glorious land. Right? So that's one of the things that will happen. Is He's going to divide the land. What we see in Joel chapter 3, verse 1 and 2 is, the one reason that eventually brings nations together to the battle of Armageddon is, they've come to divide up the land. That is the land of Israel. Until now, till now, in fact, just this past week, you know, if you've been following the news, what's happening, uh, the current Prime Minister of Israel, right, he has put a temporary pause on further expansion of the settlements in the land which the Palestinians claim for themselves, temporary. But at the same time, he's approving all the buildings that have already been built. Okay, I'm giving you, a, you know, basically, recognizing them as yeah okay we're giving building approvals for all these things that have already been built on the land which the palestinians consider for themselves as their land okay we've already built our settlements i'm saying it's approved it belongs to you know it's got the mass support of the government israeli government and yet so there is this kind of very you know delicate balance of things that are happening and it's all about the land Israel's, what Israel says is ours versus what the Palestinians say we want for ourselves. Right? And it's all happening. And at the same time, the United States is trying to pacify and say, hey, go easy. You know, they, are, they want to support the Israeli government. And yet at the same time, they don't want to seem like, you know, we are completely against the Palestinians, so there's that delicate balance of things, and different countries are, you know, um, uh, uh, even uh, uh, some of the United, European countries says, okay, we won't, uh, we will just pass a statement that we do not approve, but we will not, you know, do anything against Israel. We'll just pass a statement, we don't approve what Israel is doing, but, you know, they won't take any further action against us. And in other words, like, we, we, we're trying to be very Right, you know, so it's a very delicate balance there. But all it's all about the land. And verse 39, end of the land, end of verse 39, 
this man, he's going to divide the land for his own gain. For gain right? And verse 40, so while he is operating, so the Antichrist, he's, he's operating now in Jerusalem. You'll see in Revelation 11 that Jerusalem has been taken over by the Gentiles. They are trotting, treading underfoot for the last three and a half years. Uh, the Gentiles will be take will take over Jerusalem. Right? So he's established himself, the Antichrist is in Jerusalem, and then he's going to start facing attacks. Right? Verse 40, from the south, Egypt, from the north, Syria, the countries are going to come against him. Verse 41. He shall also enter the glorious land. So that means he's now he's occupying the glorious land. The land of Israel has taken control. And he's having power over many countries. Like he's influenced many, many nations. But very interesting, Edom, Moab, and Ammon, which are basically the people who are living in Jordan, which is east of Israel, Jordan. Very interestingly, they will escape from his hand. Verse 41. Now, why is this interesting? Because when we go to Revelation chapter 12, what we see is that when the Antichrist begins to really oppress and attack the people of Israel, it says some of them will be preserved in the wilderness. And what you know, and you connect that back to verse 41 of Daniel 11. So it's very likely that a number of Jews will escape into Jordan, which is just a neighboring country, very desert-like. And they will be preserved there. So you can cross-reference Daniel eleven forty-one with, um, I'll give you the verse in Revelation 12. Uh, can't just can't get it off hand here, but Revelation twelve, um, verse fourteen. When the woman, but the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. Revelation twelve fourteen. So the woman, representing uh, Israel uh, is for three and a half years, a time, time, and half a time, a time, times, and half a time. For three and a half years, she escapes into the wilderness from the serpent, Satan working through the Antichrist. Right? And so in a desert place. So most people look back here at Daniel 11, 41, and say, hey, Jordan escapes the control of this man, the Antichrist, who's, who's occupied the glorious land. He's overpowering many countries, but for some reason, Jordan has escaped and uh, his control, influence, maybe he overlooks it, so it doesn't bother about it. But it, that becomes a hiding place for the Jewish people during that time, those who are running for their lives. So, Verse 42, he shall, I'm going back to Daniel 11, 42. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries. And so, you know, this, this Antichrist, this king who's speaking against the God of gods and doing all of these things, he is, um, you know, just extending his influence globally over the countries. Egypt also will not escape. Verse 43, he has got economic power. He will have power over the treasures of gold and silver, all precious things. So it's verse 43 is talking about his control of the economic system. Very interesting, you come to Revelation 13. You see the Antichrist doing just that. He sets up a financial system that nobody can buy and sell unless they have his mark. Then 11.43, he's going to control the gold and the silver and the precious things, and everybody's going to, you know, give in to this. Verse 44, but, so now this is the final battle. But, news from the east and the north will trouble him. 
Revelation chapter 9, Revelation chapter 19. There are armies that come from the east. So uh, Revelation 16 talks about the river Euphrates drying up and armies coming from the east. Now, the Bible doesn't specify China, but we think, and it's highly likely, China is coming in from the east. And it could be other allied forces from the east because you're seeing a massive army of about 200 million people moving in from the east. So news from the east and from the north, exactly north of Jerusalem is Moscow. So we said earlier, Russia coming in. So Russia coming in from the north, China coming in from the east. And also very interesting how things are developing today politically. Russia and China are having some sort of alignment or friendship. It's not necessarily like, you know, brothers in arms, but there's some sort of, because they are trying to contend against the Western powers, right? So, verse 44, Daniel 11, news from the east and the north is going to trouble this king, this person who's taken over, right? And he will go out with great fury. So he's going to, hey, I'm going to fight against. These people are coming, north and south. He's occupied the land. These people are coming to do something. Verse 45, he will plant the tents between the sea and the glorious holy mountain. Oh, glorious holy mountain, Jerusalem, seas to the, to the west. So he's going to occupy that place. He's going to make that his place. But then he's going to come to an end. And there's no, no, not, nobody to help him. So really, it kind of outlines or highlights certain things about this Antichrist, what he's going to do. And as we journey through the book of Revelation, we will see all of this explicitly described for us. I was just cross-referencing Revelation 11, 12, and 13. This uh, power of the treasures of the of gold and silver, you see it in Revelation 18, when there is an economic system. Of course, it is set up in Revelation 13, Revelation 18, it all collapses. Right, so the Antichrist gains control over the economic system as well. So, very interesting here. Now, now it's of course given to us in a language of uh, Bible language and the language of Bible times, Daniel's time. But now that we have the book of Revelation, we can look back and say, hey, there's so much of parallel here between these points that have been mentioned about this particular king and what he will do and what we're seeing played out in the book of Revelation during the last seven years. It's so much parallel. Okay. Uh, any questions on this so far? Is everyone following me, uh, tracking with me? Okay. Any questions? All right, so let's try and finish chapter 12 now, Daniel chapter 12. So this is a short chapter. We're going to read the whole chapter. And uh, it's like the wrap-up, right? So Angel Gabriel takes Daniel to the end of the end. That means... He's been talking a lot now about the seven-year period. And he says, okay, let me come to the very end of that seven-year period and what's beyond that. So that's chapter 12. Let's read chapter 12, please. Um, and just three verses each. Let's go through it, and then we will uh, look into it. Anyway, we can start. At that time, Michael shall stand up and great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that time and at that time your people shall be delivered everyone who is found written in the book and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake 
some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Amen. Yeah. Yes. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, two others stood, one, one on this bank of the stream, and one on that bank of the stream. And someone said to the man, clothed in lining, who was above the waters of the stream, Okay, um, verse 6 onwards, somebody, please. One of them asked the man dressed in linen, who was now standing above the river, how long will it be until these shocking events are over? The man dressed in linen, who was standing above the river, raised both of his hands, both his hands towards heaven, and took a solemn oath by the one who lives forever, saying, it will go on for a time, times and a half, and half a time, when the shattering of the holy people has finally come to an end. All these things will have happened. I heard what he said, but I did not understand what he meant. So I asked, "How will all this finally end, my Lord?" Thank you. Someone? And he said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the end of the time. Uh, sorry, till the time of the end. Many shall be purified, many uh, made white and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of, none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of uh, desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and, who, and comes to the uh, to 1,335 days. But you go your way till the end, for you shall rest and will arise to your inheritance at the end of the days. Mm. Thank you. So, some interesting things in chapter 12. So, Verse 1, so it says, at that time, Michael, I remember Michael, we, as we saw earlier, introduced to us in chapter, end of chapter 10, um, he's the prince, he's one of the prince of princes, chief of princes, chief, chief of princes in heaven, but he's also been assigned very specifically to Israel. So that's why he says, you know, that the great prince who stands as watch over your people. So Michael is watching, spiritually, in the spiritual realm. Michael as an angel has been assigned to Israel. He's watching over Israel. But verse 1, notice what it says. At that time, the time of the end, there will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. So, when the Bible talks about something like this, it's referring to the second half of the tribulation, the three, second half. That's called the Great Tribulation. The Lord Jesus referred to it in Matthew 24. He, uh, Matthew, Matthew 24, 21. And these are all in the PDF notes, okay? I'm just kind of summarizing it, so it's all in the notes that I've shared with you. Jesus, the Lord Jesus called it the Great Tribulation. Right. The Bible also in Jeremiah 30 and verse 7, it, it refers to this period as the time of Jacob's trouble. So there is, you know, the seven-year period, which we refer to as tribulation. But the second half is referred to as the great tribulation. This is the time when there, there will be trouble specifically for Israel. Now, the whole world is going to experience God's judgment, as we will see in, Revel in the book of Revelation. But there is additional problems for the people of Israel, because this Antichrist is going to go after them. 
people of Israel. So it says there will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. It's going to be globally, it's going to be catastrophic, and even more so for the people of Israel. And it says, even to that time, and at that time, your people shall be delivered. That means only at the very end, right? At the end of this great time of trouble, this great tribulation, God's people will be delivered, right? Now, when we look at uh, Zechariah chapter 13, uh, we see that during this time of tribulation, about two thirds, two thirds of the Jewish people are going to be killed. Only one third will survive. So it's going to be massive trouble, massive trouble. Verse 2, uh, they're going to be, you know, so at the end of all of that, verse 2, now he's giving us a picture of this, um, uh, the end of everything. Many who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. Some will wake to everlasting life, some to everlasting contempt. And uh, those of us shall shine like the brightness of firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars for an ever and ever. So at the so we we know this that at the end of the seven years, when the Lord returns, right, we have there is going to be the resurrection. So there are going to be two resurrections, right? One is at the beginning, what we refer to as a rapture, at the, before the seven years tribulation starts and the Lord comes for the church, there's going to be the resurrection. People are going to be the believers are going. To, the saints are going to be resurrected. They'll receive their glorified bodies. At the end of the seven year tribulation, those who've died during the tribulation, the righteous, the saints, will be raised up again. Revelation chapter twenty, and they're going to rule and reign. So all the saints are going to rule and reign during the thousand year period. And at the end of the thousand year period, there is the final resurrection, which is every living person is going to be raised. The previous two resurrections has to do with those who have died in Christ and in, yeah, in Christ, the saints. The last one at the end of the thousand year period is the resurrection of Ev, I mean, every living person is going to be raised up. And they're going to stand before the great white throne judgment. And some are going to be ushered in. The sheep will be ushered in to everlasting righteousness. The goats will be dismissed into shame, everlasting contempt. That happens at the end of the thousand year period, end of Revelation chapter 20. Okay, so he's given an insight into that in verse 2, verses 2 and 3, verse 4. But Daniel, you write these things, close it, seal it, until the time of the end. And then he gives some signs, two important signs of the time of the end. What is the time of the, the, end, the, time of the end? Many will run to and fro, and knowledge will increase. Very interesting. So Daniel has been repeatedly asking, when are these things going to be fulfilled? And we see this again. You know, he asks, I think, two times in the remaining verses again, when is all this going to happen? And the angel is given two indicators. He says, then I'll write all this down, close the book, because it's going to happen at the time of the end. And here are two indicators of the time of the end. One, many will run to and fro. I mean, people are going to be traveling so much. They're going to be running to and fro going all over the place and knowledge shall increase so we are living in a time where both these things are being fulfilled very very dramatically 
there's never been a time when so many people are running to and fro, meaning we're just going all over the world. I mean, it's, it's just amazing. Every day, there are literally hundreds of thousands of people who are going to and fro all across the globe. They're moving. And knowledge has been increasing exponentially year on year, year on year. By the time the year starts and the year ends, we've information has just increased, grown, you know, exponentially. So there's never been a time where these two indicators have not, you know, now is the time, let me put it like this, now is the time where these two indicators that the angel gave, angel Gabriel gave, at the time of the end, that we, can't, we, we can see it so clearly before our own eyes. Now, people will run to and fro, knowledge will increase. So then Daniel, you know, he's looking, he sees two other beings on the, on the river, and then he asks again, and uh, he says, you know, um, uh, so he sees them having this conversation, verse 6, how long will the fulfillment of these wonders be? You know, how, how, how long will all of this take? And then the other angel, the other angelic being replies in verse 7, he says, a time, times, and half a time. And we've constantly you know, explained that this refers to three and a half years. One plus two, plus half, three and a half years. And what will happen? The holy people, verse, I'm looking at verse 7, the holy people will be completely shattered. So in this three and a half years, the, the, the people of God, meaning the Jewish people, people of Israel, they're going to be completely oppressed or crushed. The three and a half years, time, times, half a time. Okay. Now we can say this with very with confidence because we see it's forty-two months, three and a half years, and in uh, I think it's in Revelation. Let me see about there. <laughs> Revelation eleven verse two. He says explicitly forty-two months, which is three and a half years. So that's why we can very confidently say this phrase time times half a time is 42 months it is in the middle of the 70th week which represents seven years so middle is three and a half years right and it all makes complete sense so he's talking about the second half of the tribulation the 42 months three and a half years and the holy people will be completely shattered so daniel says you know uh, uh he, he's he he, although I heard, verse 8, he said, Lord, I don't understand these things. And then he says, Daniel, don't worry. You just write it all down, close it, leave it. Verse 10, many will be purified. They, they, they'll do wickedly. They, may, they won't understand any of these things. People are just going to keep on. Uh, uh, um, the, the wicked will do wickedly. So there are people. Who are going to be purified, we're going to be made white and refined, they're going to be the righteous, and then there's going to be the wicked. And the wicked will not understand. They will just continue on ignoring everything God has already revealed. And then he gives verse 11, he gives some more information. He says, you know, there's going to be 1290 days from the time the daily sacrifice is taken away. I'm looking at verse 11. That is in the middle of the tribulation till the end. That'll be 1,290 days. Now, it is interesting because three and a half years, and I'm, I'm just using our calendar, three and a half years is 1,260 days. But now he's talking about 1,290 days. And then he says, verse 12, Blessed are those who come to 1,335 days. Okay, so, and I put this in the PDF notes as well. It's very interesting here. 1,260 days is three and a half years. 
He says, verse 11, 1,290 days. That means another 30 days. Verse 12, 1,335 days. So that's another 45 days, or totally 75 days from 1,260 days. So we have three sets of dates, a number of days. Um, we don't have an explanation of why there is 1,290 days and 1,335 days. What can be, you know, we, and we're just thinking logically, uh, this is not necessarily biblical, but we're trying to put biblical accounts together, that it is most likely that these day, days are referring to the time when at the end of the tribulation, 30 days for the whole cleanup of Jerusalem and cleaning up of all the, you know, the, the, the defilement, the, everything that's been done and restoring of the temple. And then after 70, you know, after another 45 days, so totally after 75 days, the temple is, the work is of clean up, everything is done and the millennial temple is ready to be operational. Just thinking at it, looking at it practically, because in Ezekiel 40 to 45, we see that there's a millennial temple where these sacrifices are happening. And uh, we know that, you know, towards the end of the seven year tribulation period, the temple is desecrated and all defiled and all kinds of things happen. And then there's a battle of Armageddon and there's great destruction. So we think that this period of 75 days, or at least this 45 days, whatever period you look at, is for this whole cleanup and refurbishing of the temple until the sacrifices for the millennium resume. So that's what we think. It's just a logical thought. There is no, you know, you can't necessarily back it up with cross-referencing other places other than saying, hey, there is a millennial temple that's going to be there. So obviously the temple has to be cleaned up and cleaned out and everything restored before the sacrifices can happen. So probably that's why there's these number of days given. Okay. Then verse 13, he says, Daniel, he gone rest, and then you will rest your inheritance at the end of the days. So that brings us to the end of Daniel chapter 12. And you didn't sleep through the chapter. <laughs> Any questions? All right, so Sri, Sri uh, Kumar, how are these days calculated? Now, we, these days, uh, we must understand technically, or correctly, we must understand them as Jewish calendar days, right? Because this is Gabriel speaking to Daniel, and in his context, it always is Jewish calendar days. Uh, so there is a difference between our calendar days with Jewish calendar days by about five days every year, or three to five days every year. So I've just taken when I say 1,260 do 60 days, I've just taken 365 days for every year versus, you know, 350 for, uh, 355 days for the Jewish calendar year. But context, he's speaking to a Jewish person. So that's the correct way to look at it. Um, so, you know, we we don't know why he has said 1,290 days and then 1,335 days, 45 day gap. We don't know exactly why. He didn't give a reason to it. So we are just thinking logically, saying that maybe it's for the cleansing of the temple and before the millennial temple gets functional. I hope I answered your question, Sri Kumar. Um, um. What Sir, I also I just want to thank you. Uh, I just want to know that uh, 
can we interpret this with the with our calendar is it okay or is it something which is um, uh, because as you said it is a it is an angel who has given this this thing to the daniel so is it something connected to the spiritual uh, meaning or um, can we connect it with the jewish calendar also that is my question thank you sir yeah i wouldn't spiritualize the days i would just take it as literal days that yeah, he said there's 1,290 days and then there's 1,335 days. So I would say take, take that literally because uh, we are dealing with a seven-year period, which is a literal seven-year period. It's reaffirmed to us in many places. You know, when we come into the New Testament, he says literally, he says 42 months. Uh, it's repeated in Revelation 12, 11 and 12. So, uh, and which... In our calculation, it does work out to, you know, 1,000, approximately 1,260 days according to our cal calendar. So it all fits in terms of it being literal. So we don't have to spiritualize it. That we would, we should take it as literal. And uh, whether it's Jewish calendar or Gregorian calendar, yeah, in there that way, in terms of the year, there is a difference. So, you know, we could factor that difference in if we are interested in being very precise in our calculation. Uh, but otherwise, just take it literally. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Kennedy, now that you've talked of increasing a knowledge, how would we relate it to transhumanism? Can it be linked to Daniel's prophecy? Give direction. Trans humanism kennedy you need to explain to me what is transhumanism i am not aware of it I... okay all right i'm not uh I'm not sure how to respond to that question. How would we relate this increasing of knowledge to transhumanism? Uh, does anybody have an idea what Kennedy's talking about? Okay. I'm not sure, Kennedy, what you're referring to, but if you can tell us what you're referring to, maybe uh, I, I might be able to respond, but I, I'm not aware of um, what transhumanism is, or what you're referring to it in that. Um, yeah, so I'll just leave that question aside. <laughs> I'm not sure how to respond to that. Any other questions? Pastor, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, we see that uh, everyone who comes with the doctrine of uh, tribulation, maybe post, pre, or uh, mid, -tip, they have their convictions in their heart that they are correct. So, uh, you know, everyone is listening to all of these. But in, in view of that, I uh, just wanted to know how can this impact the life of a believer in terms of being prepared for the day of the coming of the Lord? How does it impact whether we know any of the doctrine and we are convinced about it? Hmm. Does it impact the life of a believer and, uh, and uh, you know, how it can help us to be prepared for uh, the rapture or for the day of the Lord? Hmm. Yeah, you are, you're, you're right that um, there are, different positions that people have, Bible teachers and others have, on, you know, pre-mid and post-tribulation and all of that, and which we, we saw in our second year course. So it is true. And we, we respect, you know, we are not arguing with anyone, fighting with anybody. We're just pre presenting our position. Uh, to answer your question, I think, you know, regardless of what the position is, we all are convinced and excited about the fact that Bible prophecy is unfolding before our very eyes. Um, and the things we see build, leading up to the fulfillment of what is spoken of in Revelation, in Daniel, Revelation, is exciting 
to see that hey these have so much has happened and so much is going to happen therefore regardless of where my position is in that seven year period we need to live in a state of absolute readiness and we need to be busy doing what God wants us to do and so that I think and at least for me personally that's uh, that's these are the motivations you know one is uh, I'm very excited about the Bible uh, very excited about all of these things happening before our eyes and seeing looking at them in scripture and when we go through the book of Revelation you'll see how many things that were written 2,000 years ago can only be fulfilled in our day and time and it's so exciting but it was written 2,000 years ago you know and so it's like wow the Bible is so amazing so it gives us so much you know uh, passion for God and for his truth it calls us all to live righteously in a state of readiness and it calls us all to a place of uh, uh, increased fervor in serving God uh, with the short lives we have we just have to be faithful serve God to the best we can so I think that is applicable to all of us regardless of what our eschatological position is these things uh, I think are relevant to all believers yeah okay all right I think we're a little over time here uh, Asha is your, is, your, is, your, is your question a small question or yes Pastor. go ahead uh, you want me to ask next week, Pastor? Um, yeah, so maybe if you can remember it and bring it up next week, we'll take it up because we're already into our break time. Yes, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll pick up Kennedy, Kennedy's thing next week. Okay. So I see that. Uh, yeah. So uh, I see what Kennedy means. Okay. So we'll pick it up next week. Okay, let's quickly close in prayer. We're already into our break time. Somebody could pray and dismiss us. And we'll get ready for our next class, please. God, God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you, Lord, for helping us to understand the book of Daniel. It was so uh, well detailed and how you, how you help us to understand us so good, God. I thank you, Lord, for my sashish and Thank you, God, for the opportunity to learn the deeper level of Daniel. Lord, as we have concluded the book of Daniel, Lord, that we may understand the details that we have learned and share to those who never heard about it, what it means to Lord. Just like you used the Philip God, Lord, may we also be used as you have called wherever you may be, whichever you wake up. Thank you so much, Lord, for Pastor Shish and each one of my classmates, Lord, in you we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. We'll take a break. I'll see you in the next class. God bless. Bye now.